This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. This is the first time I have done this talk, and I am very intimidated by this smart audience. So um, I'm looking forward to your questions, and we have hopefully an evening of fun and learning, and um, I hope to learn from you as well. So our order of discussion tonight, first we'll do just a little bit of history to put things in perspective. We'll talk about the cells of the immune system, about which you'll hear much more next week from Tony DeFranco. We're gonna talk about where the action occurs, the immunologic strategies of the host in general, examples of immune system malfunction, and then also how the immune system evolves over a lifetime, because our experiences as an immune host play a big role in our overall health. So I'm going to ask you a, for a question first. I don't want to be doing the person doing, I don't want to be the person doing all the work up here. So if someone came up to you on the street and said, what is the immune system, what would you say? Any ideas? What would you say if I came up to you with the microphone and said, what is the immune system? Yes. Yes, so the answer is the body's ability to fight off germs and foreign things that shouldn't be there. And that's a great general answer. And it's interesting because when you ask this question of people, we always have an easier time saying what the immune system does as opposed to what it is. Right, that's a hard one. It's even hard for me as I try to teach patients about what the immune system is. So as I sat down and I thought, well, what is the immune system and how do I explain it? I came up with a really long-winded immunologist definition. It's not all that long, but let's take a look at it. A vast communication network of cells and chemical signals distributed in blood and tissue throughout the body, human body, which regulates normal growth and development of the organism while protecting against disease. <sighs> so clearly this explains why many immunologists are socially isolated. <laughs> Please. The question is regarding whether the immune system and the nervous system are two sides of the same coin. There are definitely some clear relationships of that. Um, one place that I can think of it in particular in my job as an allergy immunology specialist is um, people who have allergic rhinitis um, often will have uh, involvement of the nervous system. If they inhale something, they sneeze. And that requires a neurologic response in addition to possibly an allergic response, but allergy isn't necessarily involved. So I'm not sure they're quite two sides of the same coin, but they can be very closely related. And hopefully we'll get into some more examples of that a little bit later on. Okay, I'd like to shorten this definition to a little slightly more workable one. A condition in humans that permits innate, which I would call hardwired, and acquired resistance to disease. And note I'm saying disease, I'm not saying specifically infection, although that is certainly a very major part of it. So tell me, what is this? And some of you have correctly identified it as smallpox. This was a young girl in Bangladesh who, this picture was taken in the 1970s, just several years ago before smallpox was finally wiped out. Now, we're taking a step back in time to look at why it is that people became interested in immunity and trying to understand it. If this were your daughter, your family member, or even if you were a thinking human being, you would want to wipe this thing out. 
This is a terrible disease and in fact has been the scourge of mankind for many, many centuries. Um, this is smallpox, which is also known as variola. There's another organism that has wreaked a lot of havoc over uh, time and history, and it's so bad that it was kind of generically called the plague. And it also had a name of black death, and you can see why, because of the literal death of the fingers of the hand of this person who had it. And as we look back through time, there's no doubt that there have been many major plagues that have almost wiped humans off the face of the planet. Some of these plagues um, may be wiped out a third to a half or two thirds of the population of whole continents. So humans have been trying for a long time through their immunity to overcome some of these nasty diseases. And don't forget about tuberculosis and inf influenza. It was less than 100 years ago that 25 to 50 million people died from one variety of influenza. And so you understand why it is that so many people scurry around when we get a new virulent type of virus. Imagine how many more people we have on the planet now than we had then. So certainly people were thinking, why is this? Why do humans get some of these horrible diseases? And so one thought was maybe this is evil humors, that there's something evil in the winds that come in that we catch somehow or that makes us sick. It's something that we inhale. We didn't know. Um, some people thought it was spontaneous generation, that it was something kind of rotting from the inside out. So there were, you can imagine humans wondering why, why is this happening? One of the um, philosophies that was held for many, many centuries is the philosophy of humorism. And we'll see this term humorism a little bit later on in the talk. But um, it was thought for a long time that the body was made up of different fluids. In this case, phlegm, blood, yellow bile, and black bile. These fluids were also associated with personality characteristics. And if you had an overbalance, underbalance, too much of something, not enough of another thing, you developed problems with these personality characteristics. And you can see some of these terms we still use today. Melancholic, sanguine. I don't think I've called anybody phlegmatic for a while. But um, you know, this, so we still have remnants of some of this terminology. And you can also see characteristics of both Indian medicine and Chinese medicine. And you can imagine that this information went all around the world as uh, traders brought these different types of ideas to different places. But along the way, we do have some records of people thinking about what is it that's going on here? And sometimes it's just a few careful observations that make all the difference. So Thucydides was an historian, and he actually was mostly a military historian. But during the plague of Athens, which happened to occur during a battle between the Athenians and the Spartans, he happened to get the plague at that time, which by history we're guessing was probably smallpox. He survived, lived to tell the tale, and he happened to notice that people who got it and lived couldn't get it again. They could care for the sick people. And it seems very simple, but it's actually a very powerful observation and important. We know that um, in 10th century China, that there were practitioners who were taking dried smallpox wounds or lesions, powdered pox, if you will, and puncturing it into other people to try to prevent it from happening. This is a procedure called variolation um, because smallpox is variola. Now, undoubtedly, people died from that, but maybe some people became immune by that practice as well. And there were Islamic physicians and Italian scientists who thought maybe there's something that's contagious. They started thinking about this concept that maybe it's one person communicating something to another person. So just a short trip through history to illustrate how some of these thought processes occurred. Now this is a very interesting lady. Never underestimate a determined mother. This is Mary Wortley Montague. She was the wife of the English ambassador to Istanbul. Her brother died from smallpox. She herself had it, but obviously did not die from it. And she had two children. She did not want them to die from smallpox. And she happened to notice that some of the Ottoman tra um, traders, not traders, um, traders passing through um, were doing this practice of, of poking people with 
smallpox. And she thought, if this prevents it, I, I want this. I want this for my children. So she went back to the King of England and said, you need to learn about this. So the King of England did what all good kings do. And the King of England said to his doctor, I want you to do this. And so they started doing it, learning about it. And eventually, as you know, Edward Jenner was the um, founder or originator of vaccination. The term vaccination, which he coined, comes from the root of cow, which was cowpox, which is less virulent smallpox. And cowpox, you can use it as a vaccine against smallpox in humans, because the cowpox doesn't kill humans. So the term vaccinate was from vaca, from the root cow, in case you did not know that. And there were some other very important concepts, too. It's only 160 years or so that we thought, well, maybe it's not a good idea to go directly from the autopsy to delivering babies. And hand washing as a concept came about at that time. And when hand washing was started in that particular ward, the rate of infection decreased tremendously. Some of these things seem so simple now. I mean, it's just hard to believe that it's so recent in history. So with rapid advancement in the, 1800s, in, in the 1800s in particular, we made amazing progress in understanding germs and demonstrating in a very systematic manner that there are germs that actually cause disease in people. And then can you imagine how exciting it must have been? I spot a virus. I spot bacteria. Um, and even Walter Reed says, it's transmitted by mosquitoes. You know, to have observed these things for the first time and to be able to share them, they must have thought, we've got it all figured out. There's nothing more to learn. We know about germs. We know about how the body works. Can you imagine how exciting that must have been at that time? And certainly in the 20th century, we've had so many improvements in vaccination. And the other key thing is we had an improved ability to look at very small things with advancements in, especially with microscopy. So with the new understanding of the concept of germs and improving technology to look at very small things, as well as inspiring practical clinical victories, scientists started to look inward and ask questions. And one question, just very basic, what is the mechanism of resistance to infection and disease? Okay. So starting to look inward now and looking at very small things. So when they started to look at the blood, what did they see? They saw blood cells. And on this slide, I've just got a very simple diagram of the blood cells. The stem cell in the top left really divides into two different categories. The stem cell in the bone marrow, which is essentially a baby cell, and it's not yet differentiated, hasn't yet decided what it wants to do. It can become a lymphocyte, which are the cells down here, or it can become a myeloid cell, which then can become any one of these other cells. With the exception of the red blood cell, the erythrocyte at the top, all of these are called white blood cells, and the white blood cells are the cells of immunity. Okay? So we'll be talking about some of these cells over the next few minutes, and first we'll be talking about some of the cells up above. But before we do that, when you look a little bit more closely, and now we've got even better microscopes, you can see some of the different cells in the blood. This one, for example, is a red blood cell. And you can see how it's kind of shaped like a lifesaver. That's because it bends. It can bend a lot so that it can squeeze through a tiny capillary to deliver oxygen and then go back into the veins. So arteries down to these tiny capillaries, it bends, does what it needs to do, and then increases in size. But the white blood cells are these kind of furry looking cells here, and those are going to be our topic for this evening. If you look even closer, here is a lymphocyte, okay? Now this is not your grandfather's textbook lymphocyte, which was just basically a round circle where we had no idea what it does. With this view, you can see this guy looks like he's ready for business. So I have another question for you. Where is the immune system? So if I were to ask you, where is the immune system, what would you say? Everywhere is the correct answer. I want you to be a little more precise. Yeah, so a lot of different answers, but let's take a, just a quick look 
at some of the main places where the action occurs. The lymphatic system is a key um, system related to immunity. And you can see bone marrow here, which is very important because this is where the cells are born, okay? Now the thymus right up here is a gland in the chest that is quite large proportionately in children, but it shrinks down a lot by the time you hit adulthood. And the thymus is key because it trains a lot of the T lymphocytes that we'll be talking about. And that's where the T lymphocytes are viewed and the decision is made, this lymphocyte should die, no, this lymphocyte's ready for prime time and we're gonna send it into the rest of the body for action. So the thymus is very important. And then you can see there are lymph nodes everywhere, but especially where there are entrances, easy entrances to the body, okay? And then the spleen is a very important lymph organ as well. There's a lot of activity of the lymph system and the immune system specifically within the spleen um, that takes place. And that's one of the reasons that if you have lymphoma, you know, some people develop lymphoma and they get a really large spleen. It's because when you get uncontrolled replication of those cancer cells, they're growing in the spleen. And that spleen can become huge. I'll never forget when I was an intern just, just out of medical school, starting on hematology, oncology, one of my first patients was a gentleman who had a, a type of lymphoma that grows very quickly. And over a period of just a few seconds, as I was standing talking to him one morning while he was getting ready for his treatment, he was telling me how he was doing, how he slept overnight, and then he said, I don't feel too good. And you're trained in medical school that when somebody says that, you believe them. That's bad. When someone says, I feel like I'm going to die. And that's what he said. And at that moment, his, pa his face went pale, and he had ruptured his spleen, and he died. And so um, the spleen is a very important organ with respect to the immune system. We don't know exactly what the appendix is for. We know that we can live without it, but it's included in the lymphatic system too. All right, so now we are going to take a wild ride of some hapless bacteria. If I were a germ and I were trying to invade you, what would I do? Where would I go? How would I try to do that? So we're going to pretend that I'm going to try to infect you, and let's just see what the immune system does, what the body does to try and get rid of me. So I call this, or why did your breakfast bagel not kill you? Because if you think about it, we don't sterilize things before we put them in our mouths, right? All day long. We have things with bacteria and viruses, but those things don't kill us. So how is it that that happens? So here we're starting to talk about immunologic strategies. Now, there are multiple routes of exposure that I could choose, and there's no doubt that there are specific infections that are peculiar to the actual location where I invade you. So for example, if I am on the outside of your feet and I am a fungus, I can cause athlete's foot. But there really aren't that many major skin infections that people, healthy people get. You can live your whole lifetime with no skin infections. So what is it really that, that keeps us healthy? Is it an appreciation for fine art? Well, in fact, it is. And I should say right up front that the immune system likes you to be happy. So whatever makes you happy is going to be healthy for your immune system. Eat well, lots of fresh fruits and vegetables that are full of color. They have lots of minerals, vitamins that are important um, in the native food for the immune system. The immune system likes regular sleep. It likes moderate exercise. Really all the things that grandma told us to do are good for the immune system. So even appreciation of fine art. But I think really what Michelangelo was trying to communicate to us here is the importance of the skin as major defense against infection, okay? Now, if as bacteria, I were lucky enough to actually be able to break your skin, I would still have difficulty because right underneath the skin are a whole bunch of parts of the immune system. Now, there are several layers to the skin, but what I want you to notice is here where it says blood, it also says and lymph vessels. Here's an artery supplying blood to the skin. Here's a vein that draws it essentially back, and right here in the middle is the lymphatic vessel. So the lymphatic system is located wherever 
organisms can go. And so if I'm a mosquito and I can poke you, or if I poke myself with a needle when I'm sewing, anything that breaches that skin will be recognized by immune cells right underneath the skin. Action will occur, and those lymphatics will be used to drain that information to a lymph node where a lot of stuff starts to happen. Okay, so if I, as a germ, am lucky enough to have direct access to the inside of you, which is what's happening here, I mean, this kid just has it right in his mouth, okay? Then there are a bunch of other things that are going to happen to me as a poor, hapless germ. Mucous membranes are very important, and I must say that I'm very pleased and thankful that I have such good friends that I can walk up and say, please open your mouth wide, I'm going to take a picture, and they say, okay. <laughs> And that's what happened here. But the point is, there are mucous membranes that are full of immune defenses. So we produce an average of a liter a day of mucus. Imagine me as a germ trying to make my way around, trying to infect you, when I'm swimming in this liter of mucus. I mean, it doesn't seem like that much, but that's about right. So just the mucus itself and how sticky it is kind of is preventative. But we also have mechanical washing, chewing, you know, you're chewing things around, and then expulsion. I can cough out or I can sneeze out. Um, if I'm lucky enough to actually make it down into the stomach, then I'm going to be washed around with hydrochloric acid. Can you imagine this? And then even beyond that, there's bacterial competition. We have probably 10 to 20 times more organisms, bacterial and variety of organisms in and on us than we have cells in our human body. We are munibuses for microbes, okay? And so beyond even that, if we happen to make it, there are these cilia, which are kind of hair-like projections. And the cilia are kind of people movers. So as a bacterium or germ, I might be on top of one of those, and these cilia your entire life, very quietly, all day long, say, this way, please, this way, please. Here's the exit. Over here, quietly, calmly, they just, the cilia are, they also have a number of other immunologic properties. We won't go into those tonight, but we used to think they were just kind of hairs that did things, but in fact, they're a very important part of the immune system. The, the cilia are in a variety of locations, and one very important place um, are the mucous membranes, but especially the lungs. So you know how after people have been smoking for years, they have a lot of mucus and difficulty clearing the mucus? Um, one of the reasons is because that smoking destroys their cilia, and they have much greater difficulty moving that mucus out. So the cilia are located in really mucous membranes almost all over the body, but they're particularly important where we inhale things and where we swallow things. Okay? Yes, sir? Where is the bacteria trying to get to? Well, so the bacteria, the question is where are the bacteria trying to get to? And that depends on what you are. If you're a bacterium or a virus, um, parasite, you have a particular predilection. So let's say I am a, has anybody here had a, a pneumonia vaccine? So a lot of people have had pneumonia vaccine, and pneumonia, the most common cause of that is a bug called pneumococcus. And pneumococcus has a particular predilection for guess what? The lungs, okay? So different kinds of organisms have different sites that they like to infect. Now, you may have heard of an organism called chlamydia, but there are different kinds of chlamydia. Chlamydia can be a genital infection, or you can have chlamydial pneumonia. Chlamydial pneumonia is one of the organisms that causes something called walking pneumonia. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. So the different bugs all have um, different places that they like to infect and particular skills as well, as we'll see later. So I'm sort of talking about a generic germ, um, but you're absolutely right. It's a great point that the different organisms are sort of targeting specific tissues. And that's one of the reasons why also it's important how they get, it, get in, whether it's through the skin or inhaled or swallowed or maybe with um, vaginal or even uh, rectal type of exposures. Um, the different exposures sometimes deter determine the type of infection. Please keep asking questions like that. That's great. Okay. So... Oh, if I've made it that far, then I'm 
wiped out by these, these small molecules called defensins. And defensins are just these little small molecules that are found all over the body. We're just learning about them really in the last 10 to 20 years. They do different things in different places. And just one example is that if I see that I'm being infected with a germ, then one of my white blood cells might have a type of defense in it that can attach to that germ, and then it pokes a hole in it and drains it of all of its essential nutrients. How cool is that? <laughs> and that's just one example of what defensins can do. But there are a whole lot of other of these small molecules too, cathelicidins, other enzyme small molecules, and toll-like receptors, which are also something just in the last 10 to 20 years that we're learning about. And these are sort of the first part of the innate immune system, things that happen all the time, don't depend on the specific organism necessarily, where there's this initial recognition, aha, you're a class of this kind of bug. And that's important because then it can tell the rest of the immune system, maybe this is the signal that we need to think about and how we need to respond. So you can see that throughout all of this, there are just so many ways that our body is um, fighting off this poor germ. Now, oh, it gets even worse, okay? So I want to introduce you to phagocytosis. If I've still survived, then I'm greeted by somebody who wants to eat me, okay? So there are professional phagocytes. And um, as we saw before, I'm just gonna go right forward, the professional phagocytes are on this list dendritic cells, neutrophils, and macrophages. And what do these professional phagocytes do? If they were to have a slogan, I thought, it would be recognize, ingest, and destroy, okay? They are on a mission. So they will ingest me, and then they're gonna spew all sorts of horrible toxic substances at me. So you can see this just gets worse and worse. So what I'm going to show you is a um, professional phagocyte chasing and engulfing bacteria, okay? And so here we go. You can see that poor little bacteria there. Chase, 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 running around, running around. The other cells. Mm -hmm. And then pretty soon here, he's gonna engulf it. Oh, there he goes. Isn't that cool? I mean, it's really just awesome. But that's what happens every minute of your life. And you don't know it because it's just happening. It happens automatically. It's part of the innate immune system. And I, I wish there were a TV show called Prevention. But there isn't, because there are no loud bells that go off. There are no gurneys flying around. It just happens, and it's beautiful. So you can imagine that if you had neutrophils that were not functioning, that actually is a kind of primary immune deficiency where people get infections with the kinds of bugs that the neutrophils are supposed to ingest. Okay? So when you see something like this happening, it gives you an idea of, oh, what kinds of things can go wrong. And there are genetic types of primary immune deficiencies where neutrophils don't function right in one way or another. Okay? I knew you would like that. <laughs> so this is another one of these professional um, phagocytes, a macrophage. And you can see in this picture, he's developing, I say he, I'm so close to these bugs and <laughs> cells. Um, where they're developing these pseudopods, where they're kind of reaching out and just looking for troublemakers, okay? So it's not these, just these round static cells that you saw in the old biology textbooks. These guys are really busy and looking for troublemakers that are causing infection. And here's another one that's really cool too. Here's a neutrophil engulfing anthrax. Remember anthrax right after 9-11? Very deadly, somebody was mailing it to people. So in orange is the anthrax, and in the yellow is this neutrophil that you can see is actually spreading itself out engulfing the anthrax. Isn't that just cool? So this is one of the many mechanisms. This is just one small part of the immune system. So that was the neutrophil. So we're going to do a brief uh, summary of what we've learned so far, and then we're going to refer, um, refer to this gentleman's question. The innate immune system does all these things that we've been referring to. Mechanical and physical barriers, 
chemical barriers and antimicrobial peptides, those little proteins that are all busy doing things. And then you got to compete with billions of other bacteria that just inhabit the system normally and for good measure. Phagocytosis. And then one more thing we're not going to address tonight, because next week Tony DeFranco will be talking with you about all this in much greater detail. And that's the complement system. And that's a really cool part of the immune system that does a bunch of things. But one notable thing is it kind of tags bacteria for identification, essentially. So it goes around tagging these bacteria so the rest of the immune system says, aha. <laughs> OK? So the complement system is also a very, very important part of immunity. So you may ask, how do the immune cells know where to go, right? In that film, it almost looked like that little bacterium was running for its life, didn't it? <laughs> but in fact, we don't think that it has legs and runs for its life. But the neutrophil does know where to go. And this is something that we've just begun also to understand in the last 10 to 20 years. And these are substances called chemokines. And chemokines are, um, so these, the neutrophils, of course, don't have little eyeballs where they can see things, but they almost have little smellers. And chemokines are little molecules that are present where there are invading organisms, okay? They're kind of like a smell that come out. This smell, this doesn't belong here. And so I've actually got another video for you. And what you will see is one of our UCSF researchers who is using his own neutrophil and tempting it with one of these chemokines. And here you can see wherever he moves that pipette, the neutrophils go in that direction. So he's releasing these little sniffers, this bad smell that comes from the bacteria, essentially. You see how it goes right towards the pipette, right where he's releasing these little chemicals. So that's one main mechanism as to how these immune cells know where to go and, and how to sort of chase after those bacteria. That's pretty cool too, isn't it? I knew you guys were going to like this. Yes, ma'am. What's the magnification on What's the magnification? I'm not sure of the exact magnification, but it's, it's tremendous, OK? I mean, these, these are very, very highly magnified. The, the neutrophil is, you have to see it only under a microscope. And in this one, it's much larger than that. So I'm sorry, I don't know the exact mag magnification. But I can tell you that um, this is sped up by seven times, OK? So this is what you saw there is, is actually about seven times faster than it actually occurs in the body, OK? Yes, ma'am. Ah, the, so the question is, how, does it, how do we clean up after this mess? Yes, and so that's a great question. And so in, in general, phagocytes, after they engulf, oh, this is, if you're obsessive compulsive, you will love phagocytes. Because the, the phagocytes chew these things up and process, process them very neatly. And then they'll take a, a piece of, of one of these little critters, and they will take it through the lymph system that I showed you, as an example, to the lymph node. And we'll get to that shortly about how it's processed. But in general, most of the phagocytes, when, when they actually ingest the bacteria or whatever it is that they're ingesting, the germs, they will shoot things at them like um, nitric oxide type substances and really toxic things that kill it. And then they kind of break it up and process it. And then the neutrophils of all of the white blood cells, the neutrophils have some of the shortest lives. Then they, too, die by a natural process um, that is called apoptosis. And I w um, undoubtedly, Dr. DeFranco will get into that next week. But basically what that is is we call it programmed cell death. OK, so there's death of some of these cells, um, but it's done in a very neat and tidy fashion. OK? So there's no actual vacuum cleaner, but there are vacuum cleaner type actions that are going on here. Yeah, they're all processed and, and dealt with in a very systematic, clean manner. OK, so to illustrate the principle of chemokine trafficking, you can see here that this cell will go in the direction of the greatest concentration of the chemokines. So wherever it senses more chemokines, that's where that cell is going to go. OK? So if that's where the bacteria are, that's where the chemokines are, your neutrophils are going to go right there. And just very briefly, if, for example, you're a neutrophil floating around in the bloodstream, and somehow I've gotten an infection in my skin or something's invaded my skin, there will be a number of chemokines in the tissue in that site. And eventually, signals are sent that that neutrophil will make its way through the wall of the blood vessel right into the tissue. 
okay? And then it follows the chemokines to the site of the infection, and then it does its stuff. So when you say the immune system is everywhere, it, you really mean it, because these things can go in many, many different parts of the body, wherever we have tissue, essentially. Yes, ma'am? Well, there are chemokines almost there are chemokines almost everywhere, and there are chemokines that are actually emitted as well. There are chemokines that are uh, it's hard to explain exactly, but there are chemokines wherever there are bacteria, and the bacteria also give off a variety of other signals that the immune system senses. So they might sense they might know, not know exactly what kind of bacteria you are, but they can look at your face and kind of know what class of bacteria you are, and then the cells that recognize that start sending out signals, okay? Those can be chemokines, yes. And that's just one example, but there are a lot of others. But I'm using the chemokines because it is a very important example and one that we're just learning about in the last 10, 20 years, okay? All right, so chemokine trafficking. Is that clear? Okay. So now, very briefly, let's bridge the innate and the adaptive immune system. So the innate immune system is all the things that happen to me regardless of my identification. I come in, there's mechanical washing. If I'm a big particulate matter, I might get coughed out. If I make it to the stomach, there's hydrochloric acid. But that doesn't really make any difference whether I'm a virus or bacteria or whatever my identity is. Those are things that just happen that are designed to kill miscellaneous invaders. But how do we know exactly who this germ is and what do we do about it? So if we have some of the skin breached somewhere in this face, and this is a super old um, illustration from the original, one of the original Gray's Anatomy textbooks about 100 years ago. And you can see they knew a lot about lymph nodes and where they were, um, but if, um, if I do break the skin, if I am as a germ able to get in, the phagocyte may or may not pick me up, but what will happen is any of this sort of debris that's left over gets drained through one of these, um, through the lymphatic system into one of these lymph nodes. And it's there in the lymph nodes that the real business starts to happen. Okay, you ain't seen nothing yet. So now we're going to be talking for just a couple minutes about lymphocytes and specifically T and B cell type lymphocytes. So when the lymphatics drain into this lymph node, which is seen here in cross section, so all the debris and whatever the innate immune system wants to present to the lymphocytes drains into the lymph node. And then there are different places in the lymph node where different types of action occur. And I'm not going to go into great detail, except to say that you have um, T lymphocytes, which are absolutely key to determining the adaptive response. So it's T lymphocytes that get communication that says, aha, I recognize you as this particular invader, that specific identification. And then there's communication that occurs from there. And so with this one, when the T lymphocyte recognizes what's going on, the T lymphocyte is kind of, have you, have you ever been to London in the, the war room where Churchill had his command center? And all of the commands go out from there. And this is kind of what happens in the lymph node where the T lymphocyte can send out specific directions about what to do. Now, if the T lymphocyte says this is pneumococcal pneumonia, potential for that, this is a pneumococcal organism, we need to make antibodies specifically because it's antibodies that are the best at attacking pneumococcal organisms. So the T lymphocyte might give that instruction to the B lymphocyte and one of the ways it does that, we've now learned, is they essentially attach to each other through receptors. I mean, physical, there's a physical attachment where they're communicating back and forth. And so um, thank you to um, another one of our faculty. I should say that the neutrophil chemotaxis video that I showed you, that was um, Orion uh, Weiner, uh, his, his video. I wanted to give credit where credit is due. It was also his neutrophil, too. Um, this one is from Jason's sister. And this one shows B cells attached to um, T cells. And the B cells are in red. The T cells are in green. And the T cells 
are essentially communicating to the B cells. This is, um, he, he mentioned specifically, this is the activity that occurred after this um, uh, lymph node, this individual, was vaccinated, okay? So after the vaccine, you can see how the red and green cells, some of them are physically attached to each other. And that's where the T cells are communicating to the B cells, we need to make antibodies, we need to make antibodies. Okay, so there's a very clear signal that's going on that involves multiple steps and processes, but that's actually happening in a lymph node. It's super cool. And then the B cell will mature and start to make antibodies, which will specifically attack pneumococcus. Again, um, this is an introduction to next week, so you can see what you're in for next week. Yeah, so the question is then, with respect to this process of the phagocytosis, um, the connection of that with what we're talking about now. Um, so the phagocytes, the macrophages, dendritic cells, and neutrophils, they all have slightly different mechanisms of doing things. But as an example, um, the one that I showed you, the macrophage, which had the pseudopods that were forming, when that engulfs something, the macrophage will chop it up and then express a little bit of it on its surface. It then takes it to some place where it can communicate with these lymphocytes. And then the lymphocyte, particularly the T lymphocytes, decides what needs to be done about it. So yes, much of the destruction that's done in the peripheral tissue as the innate immune processes are first trying to do battle up front. It's kind of like the Marines or the Army at the front line trying to hold things while decisions are being made about how best to plan the attack. So that is communicated into the lymph node, and we'll talk about the timeline of all that in just a second, into the lymph node, and then the lymphocytes make decisions about what to do about that. So to reiterate, after identifying the invader, the lymphocytes generate an immunologic response that specifically and maximally targets that pathogen. Okay, so this is the important point about the part of the immune system that knows specifically who I am as a germ. And when that happens, watch out, okay? I'm just toast. So importantly, they also generate memory cells for future protection. And that's important, um, a principle that you're familiar with, with vaccination. Okay, the first time with vaccination, the body thinks, oh, I'm being exposed to measles. I better make some antibodies. The process that I showed you is similar to that process that occurs. Okay, so you make some antibodies so that the next time the next time that the body actually happens to um, uh, see it, it has a much greater response. Sorry, let me just back up for a step here. Um, got ahead of myself for a moment answering the question. So lymphocytes can do different things. Lymphocytes can choose to directly kill infected cells. Okay, so that's called, a, you can have a cytotoxic response. So there can be lymphocytes that just shoot things at it and kill it, or a lymphocyte here can choose a helper lymphocyte, for example, T helper lymphocyte, can choose to tell the B cell, we need antibodies against that organism. And then the B cell produces all of these antibodies that are specific, for example, to pneumococcus. This is really important because most of you probably have somewhere in the order of one to 10 billion specific antibodies to different things to which you have been exposed throughout your lifetime. Okay, so that's one of the things that helps us to understand when you're exposed to something, why your body just battles it off. No big deal, we can handle that. No big deal, I've, I've got antibodies against that. Okay, and these antibodies are what is induced with vaccines. Okay, so, yes? Does it really have any The B cell um, that I showed you in that previous picture matures into something called a plasma cell, and it just becomes an antibody-producing machine that is very specific. It matures in that lymphocyte, and I know that um, you'll learn more about this next week, but that B cell matures, and it starts, it has this signal about what its job is. And then after that, it just starts producing antibody after antibody specific to that one particular organism, okay? So what is an antibody? Let's answer that. An antibody, you may have turned, heard also the term immunoglobulin. They're, they're synonymous. It's the same, uh, different terms for the same thing. It's a large Y-shaped protein produced by the B lymphocytes. And the antibodies can identify and neutralize 
the germs. And they can do that by several different mechanisms that you'll learn more about next week, but the antibodies essentially can glom onto these germs and, and also target them for destruction. So, yes. Oh, what a great question. So the question relates to whether people who have gone through um, treatment for cancer, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, are they able to retain memory? Um, and the answer is a qualified, that depends. And I'm sorry to sort of bow out of it that way, but there are different types of treatments and some will affect the immune cells more than others. But I can tell you that as an immunologist, I am totally amazed by people, including a very good friend of mine who had lymphoma and had his immune system wiped out, then had an autologous stem cell transplant and just has really not gotten sick. You know, so I think that, that there are parts of the immune system that really are completely wiped out, but I think there are things that we still don't appreciate, um, including some of the innate immune defenses that aren't necessarily wiped out. So the answer to your question is yes, you can impair some long-term effects of the immune system, and some you kind of need to reacquire again. There is vulnerability. But I'm actually kind of amazed that it's not more than, than it is. Um, why that is, I don't know. <laughs> and Dr. DeFranco may be able to address that better too. The thing I wanted to address very simply on this slide of an antibody here is this right here. This is what is specific with every single antibody. This is called the variable region, and that is exactly what is adapted to a specific germ. So every antibody that comes out of a plasma cell is identical, okay, for a specific germ, but this is the part on every antibody that's different, okay? So your antibodies, you'll learn about this more, but you'll have IgA, IgG, IgM, IgE, different kinds of antibodies. This part is pretty much always the same, but this varies depending on the organism. And the immune system has a remarkable way of making this on the spot, okay? And then remembering it over time to be able to target that specific organism. This is just illustrating the concept of learning where to begin with it might take a number of days before you get your first antibody response, but then um, I feel sorry for that poor hapless organism if a first cousin or another one like it comes along because the next response is whoom, because you already have antibodies, you're ready, you're primed, and that's why vaccinations work. Okay. So another important concept, how do lymphocytes communicate their orders? Okay, so we know that these T lymphocytes are giving out orders. I want you to do this, I want you to do that. How do they do that? One of the mechanisms by which they do that is some chemicals called cytokines. And basically I was thinking, how do you explain a cytokine? And the best way I could think of is it's kind of a text message that induces your friends or your buddies to do specific things. So if, for example, um, the, the germ is tuberculosis, then a cytokine will be sent out by the lymphocyte to other specific cells specifically to put out chemicals for tuberculosis, okay? So cytokines are like text messages that go to other parts of the immune system saying, this is how we're going to coordinate the attack. So cytokines are absolutely key for communication about how to coordinate the attack. Very, uh, very quick explanation of a complicated principle. So if I, as a German, am fortunate enough to be a parasite, then I'm going to be overwhelmed by a number of other cells that were up on that slide, and we're not going to go into that tonight, but probably most key for most of the parasites are eosinophils, um, which are amazing cells that can um, keep these parasites at bay. So let's summarize before we get into some of the fun uh, clinical stuff what we've done, innate immunity, some of the defenses that are there for almost any germ that comes into the body, the adaptive immunity, and if it's the first time for exposure, then it'll take a little while and there's a directed specific response and memory is formed. If it's uh, not the first time and the immune system has previous memory, there's going to be a very big, very fast directed response because the immune system has already seen that memorized it and is ready and just waiting for you to come along. And then none of this would be possible without the help of chemokines and cytokines. Okay? Phew. Would you say again how the 
Yeah, so the question is how the lymph system is regenerated after it's been destroyed. Um, so in the case of the stem cell transplant, and that's exactly the, the topic that you'll hear in the six weeks, is how does bone marrow and stem cell transplant work? But basically what you do is you start all over again. You start with new baby cells and you let the cells mature. Now you don't lose all of your defenses, especially those innate defenses. But you essentially are starting with baby cells again, like I showed you on that slide of all the cells where you had the stem cell up in the very top corner, so that those cells just kind of start all over again. Okay, so it's a very um, intriguing, complex process but in some cases, it really works well. It's not for the faint of heart. It's quite a procedure, and any of you who've been through it or have family members or friends who've been through it know that it's not for the faint of heart, but it can help tremendously where no other things help. And that's why I wanted Dr. Cowan to come talk with you too, because there's so many people who, who themselves or their friends have been through things like this, it's important that you really have a good understanding of that, that you take home and devote some time to that. Okay, so uh, just as a general time course of all of this, the innate immune system, zero to four hours. The early induced immune system, some of the early recognition, sort of uh, a few hours to a few days. Adaptive immune system, generally the first time around, is gonna take a number of days. Okay, so that's why you wanna have really good innate immune responses to hold the fort until your lymphocytes can give directions and address the problem. Yes? The question is regarding colds. Cold viruses are the sneakiest thing. For one, there are lots of different cold viruses. And so if your body has seen that particular virus before, you may not get that cold at all. Remember how I said that for much of your life, you don't even notice when your body battles something off? That's the case with a lot of viruses to which we're exposed. But if you're exposed to that cold virus for the first time, you may not have the immediate defenses to battle it off. So there are a lot of cold viruses, and the other thing that happens, which we talk a little bit more about in a few minutes if you'd like, is the sneaky ways that some of these germs have of disguising themselves or looking like somebody else, not what the immune system is expecting. And many of these viruses kind of change their appearance a little bit. So just when the immune system thinks it knows who you are, you change your appearance and it says, oh, I don't know you, I can't respond to you that way. So you have to respond to it another way. So that's one of the sneaky ways that a lot of germs have of getting around the immune system is sort of subverting a lot of these defenses or changing their appearance before the immune system. The other problem is there are so many different cold viruses that throughout a lifetime you can be exposed to a lot of different ones. So very briefly, the concept of tolerance. Tolerance is hugely important in the immune system. So why is it that I don't kill myself all the time. How is it that my immune cells know that my cells are me and germs are not me, okay? So remember I was telling you about the thymus. The thymus is what trains the lymphocytes, the T lymphocytes in particular. And the T lymphocytes go through this sort of testing process. It's kind of like they need to show the right papers in order to pass and become a, a lymphocyte that will be working in the body. So a T lymphocyte needs to be able to recognize me Okay, but it also needs to be able to recognize a foreign invader. But I don't want a T lymphocyte to recognize me so much that it, it sticks to my cells and then starts to destroy me. Okay, so if I have a lymphocyte that's attaching to my cells instead of germs, that's a problem. That's called autoimmunity. Okay, so if my cells are attaching to me thinking I'm germs, I start destroying myself, I get autoimmune diseases. And you're all familiar with many autoimmune diseases, lupus, uh, multiple sclerosis, most common thyroid problems are a type of autoimmune disease where the body is making antibodies that are attacking the thyroid gland. So this concept of tolerance is very important. We see it also for, uh, in allergies. So why is it that dust mite and cat dander for most people are no problem, but if you're allergic to it, the immune system freaks out. The immune system should say, oh, dust mite, cat dander, who cares? right, and just pass it by. So you need to be able to have tolerance to be able to focus on the important things and leave the unimportant things alone and also not attack yourself. You do not want your own immune cells attacking yourself. So that's the, the concept of tolerance. And you, again, you'll learn more about this next week. Yes, ma'am. Is there a different breakdown of 
So the, really the question is, how does autoimmunity happen? And um, that's a question of great research right now. And if you have nothing else to do, please become an immunologist and study mechanisms of tolerance. Um, but I can give you an example in some of my patients who have primary immune deficiencies where they have parts of the immune system that are not functioning. They have either no B cells at all, so they're not making any antibodies at all. So for the patient who, for example, um, is invaded by pneumococcus, that pneumonia bacteria, they have almost no adaptive defense against that. Um, but those people have also a, a greater chance of having autoimmune diseases. They might have um, their own antibodies attacking their thyroid gland or their own antibodies um, attacking some of their blood cells. Um, so we don't know exactly why that happens, and it's, it's a huge topic of research why, right now. Why is it that some people develop cells that attack themselves, and why is it that some people are healthy for 45, 55, 60 years, never have any evident autoimmunity, and then all of a sudden develop an autoimmune disease? In the old days, it was blamed on gods. Um, more recently, we've blamed it on viruses. It's probably multiple mechanisms, but it's an area of very active research, and we need all the help we can get. So tolerance is an important concept. OK. Now, if you were to come see me, I would be taking a history from you to find out all of your where you've been, where you've lived, what kinds of exposures you've had, what's your occupation, because all of things, these things affect your immune system. So, of course, your genetic influences start at conception. You're born, uh, you're conceived, and, and you have the genes from your parents. Not much we can do about that yet in most cases. But, for example, if you have um, two parents, if both your parents have allergies, say allergies causing asthma, allergies causing eczema, as a kid, you are probably 50 to 70 percent um, uh, have a 50 to 70 percent chance that you will have some type of allergy. So there's genetic predisposition to some immunologic disorders. We know that. Prenatal influences. So if, if I have peanut allergy and I am pregnant, should I eat peanuts or should I avoid peanuts? Will that have an influence on my child? And that's a great question right now. We don't quite know the answer to that because we know that perinatal, so around the time of childbirth, before and even after childbirth, the exposures um, that that child has are important in helping to shape the immune system in the long term. Those immune systems in those little kids are just working as fast as they can, learning from day one. We actually have a little predilection. I'm giving you a hint of Homer Boucher's talk here. When we're born, we actually have a little predilection towards the allergy kind of immunity. And we think that exposure to a lot of the viruses and maybe even to the things that we've wiped out, like, well, TB is not wiped out. It's still around. But most of us are not exposed to TB as youngsters, and most of us don't get it as youngsters. Um, smallpox, some of the things that people got before probably trained the immune system in a way to respond properly. We don't exactly know about that. But it's, some, again, something that's being researched right now and, and key really at the core of this hygiene hypothesis. Um, lifetime exposures to microbes. We do know that some bugs can lead to some diseases. So for example, if you have strep throat and your strep throat is not properly treated, some people will then develop a couple, two, three, four, five weeks later, kidney failure. Not related to the strep, but related to a sort of an aberrant immune response that can occur after that. And some of the questions related to autoimmune diseases, is rheumatoid arthritis related to an infection? So again, this is an area of active research. Birth order. If you are a first child, you are more likely to have hypersensitivity disorders, such as allergies, than if you're the fifth kid. Is this the hygiene hypothesis? Well, think about it. If you're the first kid, mom and dad are keeping everything clean and everything's in order and, and there are no germs anywhere. But if you're the fifth kid, imagine what the place looks like. You know, there's a dog and a cat and feces everywhere and kids spitting all over you. You get exposed to so many germs as a fifth kid that there is some evidence that the first kid, bec maybe because they're so clean, is more likely to develop allergies than the fifth kid. Okay? Again, that's part of this hygiene hypothesis. That's going to be a great talk. Um, your occupation. So if, you're, if you have a predilection to asthma, you may not get it at all in your lifetime. 
unless you're a baker, in which case you might be inhaling wheat flour. And if you have, say, grass allergy, you might develop asthma to wheat flour. Okay, So your occupation plays a role in how your immune system turns out. Where you live. I have a patient with a severe immune deficiency, but he almost never gets pneumococcal pneumonia or any of these other bugs that we pass around because he lives out in the Nevada desert and almost never sees anybody. You know, so where you live makes a difference. I'm going up and down in the elevator all day with 20 people coughing on me. You know, so I guess I could say my immune system's stronger because you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to develop all of these um, antibodies to things. And how to age gracefully. And this is a little bit of what we were talking about before. How we care for ourselves is very important to the immune system. If I get enough sleep, if I um, eat well, if I exercise with moderation, all things that are good for a healthy immune system. Okay? So the immune system evolves throughout our lifetime. Examples of things that can go wrong, and we'll discuss a couple of these more in a few minutes and talk about some of the things that you would like to discuss. So microbes can outsmart the immune system. For example, many of these viruses are very sneaky. Rather than being outside like that poor little hapless bacterium that got engulfed by the neutrophil, they sneak into a cell. They sneak right in there, and then they hide. And then they use that cell's machinery to multiply. So that's an example for, with HIV. HIV is a virus that gets inside the cell, and then HIV can replicate. Okay? So viruses, many of them are very sneaky, trying to bypass many of the immune defenses by getting into a cell and then kind of hiding. Pretty clever. Um, cancers can grow unchecked. I talked about this concept of programmed cell death. Our cells have a normal turnover rate, and programmed cell death is a very neat process. But if you have an abnormality in programmed cell death, and as a cell, you don't grow, but you keep multiplying, 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 and you don't get those signals to die properly, you can develop cancer. Okay? So some cancers are a particular kind of cell that keeps multiplying, multiplying, multiplying itself and not dying properly. That's a very simplistic explanation, but I hope it conveys the concept. Neutral visitors are viewed as foes. That's the cat dander, dust mite allergy type thing. Who cares? You know, why should you have this horrible allergic response to cat dander? Okay, so sometimes the immune system has hypersensitive responses as opposed to not reacting enough to things. Or the body attacks itself, and that's autoimmune diseases. So, in summary, we've looked at a short history of diseases that have plagued humankind. We've looked at base, the basics of cells and anatomy of the immune system and principles of things that can go wrong, and evolution of the immune system throughout a lifetime and the importance of those influences. So at this point, what I would like to do is just open it up to um, case discussions and clinical questions and some fun things that you guys probably think about on a regular basis. So questions first, and then I know that we're theoretically supposed to go for another half an hour, but we'll take some questions, and when we're done, we'll break. Yes, ma'am? So the question is related to um, the effects of medications on the immune system, and that depends entirely on the medication. Some medications are no problem whatsoever for the immune system. Uh, some medications can actually cause suppression of certain parts of the immune system. So for example, um, prednisone is probably the classic example. Prednisone kind of suppresses multiple parts of the immune system, particularly as pertains to some of the lymphocytes. But um, it, it can be very, very helpful for nasty diseases, such as autoimmune diseases and others. But because it's non-discriminatory, it affects multiple parts of the immune system altogether. That's one of the reasons why we've now developed targeted immune therapies that go directly for the source of a particular problem. So most medications are probably not a problem for the immune system, but some of them certainly are, and that's something that your doctor should be able to communicate with you if you're starting on a particular type of medication, whether or not it's a problem with the immune system. So it's a, a generic response because it depends entirely on the medication. Yes? Yeah, so gamma globulin is another term um, as an example for antibodies 
Um, and one specific kind of antibody might be the IgG antibody. And the IgG antibody, remember I showed you that Y-shaped antibody and the B cells putting out the antibodies? Well, 100 years ago, it was noted that you could just administer not the blood cells, but, but the serum, the rest of the blood to someone, and they would have um, protection against certain types of diseases. And that's because they were getting the benefit of people's antibodies. The problem is we now know that if you get somebody else's blood or body tissue into you, what happens? You reject it. Okay, you reject it. So people could get very sick. One illness called serum sickness. Um, it seemed to work, and, and it would work, but then you would get serum sickness, which is a kind of a rejection or immunologic process. But we do use gamma globulin, um, specifically um, the IgG antibodies in, for example, my patients who have a primary immune disease where they don't make any of it. So uh, 25, 30 years ago, the most common way to give that was an intramuscular injection. But that didn't work too well because it had to be absorbed just right and it was hard to get the right level. Now, for people who have primary immune deficiencies, I give them prescriptions for uh, intravenous gamma, gamma globulin or we can put it right under the skin. And that essentially replaces the immune system that they're missing, the antibodies. So if you think about it, it's great for them because there are blood donors. You know how there are some donors who are there every week donating? And they might be donating more of the plasma as opposed to just the red blood cells. And so these people who received gamma globulin or intravenous IgG immunoglobulin, these terms are, all mean the same thing, they are actually getting the benefit of many, many people's immune systems because there are many people's blood who goes into purifying that IgG. And so my patients come to me and they say, you know, not only have I not had pneumonia for a year, but I'm not really getting sick at all. Everybody else around them is getting sick. And these are people who've had recurrent sinusitis, pneumonia, sinusitis again, maybe colds, other bad infections that they get. But then when they suddenly get the donation of all of these antibodies from other people who've donated them, many of them are leading very healthy lives. But there's a lot of variation in these immune deficiencies, but some people really just don't make antibodies, and they do well when they're infused with antibodies. And that's a, a treatment that's well-known, well-established, and works really well. Yes, sir? Yes. So the question is um, using radiation treatment for curing cancer. So I'm not an oncologist, but really what radiation does is radiation is there to destroy those cancerous cells. So remember how I mentioned sometimes with cancer, the cells are replicating themselves in the same cell over and over and over, and that's how you get these big tumors. There's no turn-off mechanism. There's no mechanism that's turning that tumor off, so it just grows and grows and grows. And radiation is one mechanism by which you can actually kill those tumor cells. And so one of the big challenges of radiation therapy is how do you kill the tumor without killing the host? And so that's why you try to really target radiation to a specific spot. But certainly there can be adverse effects with radiation treatment because it's hard to only get the tumor, say, inside the breast and not get the tissue that, that uh, leads you there also. So radiation oncology is um, uh, a field that has really made tremendous strides in recent past. But the principle of it is to try to specifically kill those tumor cells. OK? Yes, ma'am. OK, so the question relates to use of vaccines in people who have autoimmune disease. Um, and I think it's really a very good and interesting question. I think that vaccinations, because they actually use um, uh, parts of the immune system that are a little bit different than this autoantibody process, um, I don't have a problem with, for the most part, for patients with autoimmune diseases, using vaccination. They can still benefit from it a lot. And remember that when you get vaccinated, you're going to be making antibodies that are just very specifically to that germ. Okay, So that antibody is not going to turn around and start attacking tissue, because it's very specifically to that germ. Now that said, it's kind of complicated, because sometimes some of our um, tissues appear, have a slight appearance like the surfaces of some germs, and it is possible for antibodies to get confused. But when you think about the fact that we probably have 10 billion specific antibodies, 
the few extra antibodies that we get for vaccines probably are not going to be related really to autoimmune diseases. Now, that's actually a good question for um, the talk that we have on autoimmunity. And um, I'd be interested to hear what he has to say about it as well. Okay. Yes. Yes. So the question is, what's happening with the body if you have a nasty reaction to something like a tetanus shot? So um, a tetanus shot um, goes, as you know, goes into the arm. And many of us have reactions to those tetanus shots. Part of that is your immune system reacting to it. So number one, before you swear because it, you know, it hurts, which it does, <laughs> that's right, you can say, well, thank you to begin with that I have an immune system that's capable of reacting. So you have an immune system that's there that's reacting. And that's called a localized response as opposed to the systemic response that you'll get um, from the vaccine. But yes, that is an immunologic response, and some of us have a more sort of fulminant, localized response by parts of the immune system that we were talking about earlier. And why that happens, we don't know, but some people do have very sensitive skin, and whatever you do with the skin seems to give a sort of a hyperactive response. But that is the immune system reacting. So some people say that when they get the flu shot, they get the flu. What they actually get is they get an immune response. And that immune response can manifest with a little bit of fever, a little bit of body aches. But that's your immune system working. It's not influenza. Influenza is not a live vaccine. Okay. So the question is regarding what causes it when these are, there are some people who have no B cells, don't make them, or don't make antibodies. And um, I'm glad you asked because that's an area of interest of mine. And currently, I'm working with a geneticist and an infectious disease doctor here at UCSF. And we are um, asking some of our patients who have this immune deficiency to donate some blood so that we can do genetic analysis. So far, we have identified about, not we, but we in the generic sense, others, have identified about 5 to 10% of the genetic abnormalities that are the reason that some people just make no B cells. And we can measure this in the blood. I can do a blood sample, just draw a blood sample from you, and I can count your B cells and see if you have them or not. And some people just don't make them. And there are different types of primary immune deficiencies that will result in loss of B cell. But as you can see, there are all different processes that are involved in actually getting to antibodies. You know, there are many signals that are involved before you actually get production of antibodies. So if you have no IgG antibody in your blood, it could be that you're not making B cells and therefore you're not making antibodies. Or it could be you've got all sorts of B cells, but the B cells aren't functioning right. They're there, but they're just sitting there doing nothing. And if they're doing nothing, you're not making antibodies. So there are lots of signals and lots of processes to get to that point to make antibodies. So you can see how complicated all this is. Yes, and you will hear a little bit more about that um, with Andy Gross's talk. His focus is autoimmune disease, but the principle is actually the same with some of the cancers. And what you want to do is you want to find something in particular. This is one mechanism. You can find something in particular on the surface of that cancer cell. It might have a particular, uh, it's, let's say, the equivalent of a nose. You know exactly what that nose looks like. And so you can target the immune system to start attacking noses that look like that. Okay, so what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to find something in that cancer cell that you can specifically target so that when you get your immune cells primed, it will go exactly to that cancer cell that has that identity because each cancer cell, um, uh, each cancer is its own specific kind of cancer cell. And if you can identify something that's peculiar about that, then theoretically you can induce immunity to attack that particular cancer. OK, so yes, those, those treatments are available now, and, and uh, some of them are in, in process. Um, there's one that many of you have probably heard about, and we can use this as kind of a, a case. Um, for example, um, some of the B cell lymphomas, where some people have lymphoma, where they're making the B cells, the B lymphocytes that we talked about, but the B lymphocytes, one of them has become a cancer cell. So it's replicating itself over and over and over and over. And so you're getting masses of these tumor cells that are all these B lymphocytes all over the body. That's one kind of lymphoma. And so just for as a case example, there is now a medication called rituximab, rituxan, some of you may be familiar with it, that specifically targets an identifying 
um, marker on the outside of B cells. Okay, so the B cells will have one marker that is a hallmark that says, hey, I'm a B cell, and rituximab is designed so that it only identifies cells that have that marker, so it only kills those B cells, okay? Now, you can imagine that that is probably not with completely without other problems, because remember, you need B cells to be able to make antibodies, and so we would like to be able to target just that cancer cell but rituximab targets B cells in general, because all the B cells have that marker. But as time passes, we're starting to come up with medications that will target the specific cancer cells. All right? Okay, so um, let me ask you this question. What is pus? Now that you've heard this whole talk, what do you think pus is all about? White blood cells. Phagocytes, yes! So pus is this process where these phagocytes come in and they chew these things up and then there's a bunch of debris left over, okay? And that's pus. So on the one hand, you look at it and you say, ugh, that's pussy. But then you should say, oh, that's awesome, it's pussy, okay? <laughs> because your immune system is working. Now obviously, if you have a lot of pus, that can be a hallmark of a bad infection. But pus can actually be a good thing, okay? Because that means that your phagocytes are working and, but you're going to have a lot of debris left, and it takes the body a while to clean that up, okay? So what is inflammation? Well, it, so one answer is inflammation is swelling, and that's actually a correct answer. Inflammation has swelling because whenever you have an immune reaction like this occurring, you need to get blood there, and, and, and you need to get fluid to the site of the tissue where that, um, the immune system has to work. That needs fluid, and that causes swelling, okay? So yes, that's swelling. But in general, it's the immune system at work. It's an inflammatory response, which means that you have white blood cells doing things. Now, inflammation can be good because when you get a sore throat, you get inflammation in there, right? You've got your white blood cells are doing what they need to do. But sometimes inflammation can get a little out of hand, and you can get inflammation as a consequence of autoimmune disease, too. Um, inflammation as in arthritis, where you get an inflammatory arthritis and you get a lot of immune cells in a joint maybe where they don't belong. So inflammation can be good or inflammation can be bad, okay? So, but in general it means that you've got an active immune system. So I also wanted to ask you, um, do you want to, let's say that you are having some problems with infections, and you want to make yourself healthier, especially in cold and flu season, do you want to take something that calls itself an immune booster? This is a loaded question, isn't it? <laughs> well, especially if you're an autoimmune patient, you do not want to take something that's called an, an, a, an immune booster. But you can see how something that's labeled an immune booster is just so simplistic. Okay, you guys have now sat through this discussion of just the basics of the immune system, and now you can see how complex it is. Okay, so it's like saying, do you want to boost the weather? Well, maybe sometimes, <laughs> if you want more sunshine and it's too cold. But, you know, boosting weather might give you a hurricane. So it's just too simplistic. And there are things that you do not want boosted in your immune system. And one of your take-home messages for tonight is the immune system is all about balance. You need to have things balanced. You need to have enough of this and not too much of that. And you need to have these things working in concert with each other. If you have way too much of some of the immunoglobulins or antibodies that are IgE antibodies, then you may have lots of problems with allergies. Do you want to boost that? So this is one of the things that, one of the reasons that I took this job was to be able to communicate concepts such as that, that the immune system is very complex, it's all about balance, and when people are trying to sell you products, you just have to be careful about what the claims are. They may or may not be good for you, okay? Um, so how about tonsils? If a little kid has tonsils, a child this big has these big tonsils, is that good or bad? So you think it's good, and for the most part it is, because those tonsils are what? Working. They are working lymph nodes, okay? So there is an awful lot of B cell, B lymphocyte activity occurring in tonsils. And the normal role is for those B cells to be working away in those little kids, developing memory, fighting off germs. They're working hard. So 
yes, we can live without tonsils, and tonsils can be problematic. If they're too big, they can get inflamed, there's that word, and you can get pus, there's that word, and sometimes, rarely, they have to be taken out. But actually, the presence of tonsils in a very small child tells us that that child has an immune system. Okay, so if I have an infant with no tonsils, that's one of the hallmarks of an infant with a primary immune deficiency. Okay, because we expect them to have lots of B lymphocytes in tonsils. And then as you grow older, they start to fade because our immune systems are more mature. Now here's another good question for you that's related to um, a woman who um, delivers and she has a normal childbirth and the child is healthy and I want to know from you, why is that child, who's never been exposed to the world, why does that child really, for the most part, most kids will stay healthy, even in those first six months of life when they have no immune experience? How does that happen? Oh, you guys are so smart. <laughs> so mom passes some of those IgG antibodies, in particular, through the placenta to the kid. And those IgG antibodies are going to last for maybe six to eight months or so. So that kid has got a lot of protection from a mature immune system, six to eight months, but then it starts to wear off, and that kid is in kind of a vulnerable period where the child has not yet really developed a lot of immune defenses, and mom's antibodies are wearing off. So sometimes we see kids right in that six to eight month period that present with their first bad infections. And that's a time when we often identify primary immune deficiencies because that child might be protected if the main problem is no antibodies, might be protected until he or she is six to eight months old, okay? So infants gain Protect, uh, protective immune uh, function from their mothers. And that's pretty awesome, too. Yes, ma'am? So, infants that get sick are definitely the problem. So, the question really is to inheritance. Um, it depends on the kind of immune deficiency. Some of them have very clear inheritance patterns, um, some of them do not. So, for example, with the many of the patients who lack the antibodies or immunoglobulins, especially if we first identify them as adults, and the oldest patient I've identified with a primary immune deficiency was 92, okay? And she was just not happy because she was getting these recurrent infections, colds and flus. She had had pneumonia a bunch of times. And so we talked about, um, it turned out that her immune system, and it's hard to tell sometimes because by that age, uh, sometimes a lot of the normal immune function that we test isn't working quite so well, but she clearly had an immune deficiency and had always been the sick person her whole life. So when we discussed the option of possibly um, her using immunoglobulin, as we were talking about before, either intravenously or infused through the skin, which has to be done once a week if it's infused through the skin, she just didn't know about that. It was going to interfere with her social life. You know, she just, I don't know, two, three extra hours a week to get that treatment. But once she got on it, she was very happy she did because she was much healthier. And she's a very vibrant woman who's now, I think she just turned 95. Um, and she's very active, very vibrant, and just a, a delightful lady. So the answer is some of these immune deficiencies are inherited, and some of them seem to occur sporadically. And that's why we're trying to understand what is it that you know, how many of these are sporadic and can we identify ahead of time who is going to develop that problem? Yes, ma'am? So does nursing the baby pass antibodies to the baby? Well, um, that's, the nursing does give you some passive protection, but it's not like antibodies going right through the placenta. So yes, you can get some protection through nursing, and that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, why nursing is a very good idea. But it's not going to be like the antibodies that come through the placenta that provide really very specific um, protection, especially the first six to eight months. Yes. Yes, ma'am. I knew probiotics would come up tonight. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a great question because a lot of people do take these organisms, so-called friendly bacteria. So when do you need them? Well, we are loaded, as I mentioned before, we are just loaded with um, different types of organisms. And most of those organisms do have a role and do have a function in the health of our bodies. And Dr. Boucher will be talking about one of his favorite topics. He loves that topic. So he'll be going into that in some detail. 
But yes, there are some times when our normal bacteria get out of balance. And so although I think many of the people who take probiotics probably don't really need them, in general, if they're taken in a conservative fashion, um, they're probably not going to be harmful. The challenge is, is that we have many, many different kinds of bacteria in our gut. And what you buy over the counter is likely just to be one or three or four or five different kinds. And we don't know exactly how what they do differs from what's normally in the gut. So there are some circumstances, for example, if you're taking an antibiotic that's a broad spectrum antibiotic and you're prone to yeast infections, you might be someone who benefits from at the same time supplementing with normal bacteria. Now will that interfere with the, um, with the antibiotic? I mean, there are some things that we don't know. But yes, in some cases where the normal gut flora has been interfered with, either because of a disease process, for example, Crohn's disease, which is a kind of autoimmune inflammatory bowel disease, some people who have that have gut flora that doesn't function quite right. And there may be some other things, such as those little defense in molecules I was showing you that don't work right. We're just in our infancy of learning about these things. But um, for some people, it may be appropriate to take probiotics to try to restore normal gut flora. Um, exactly who should get it, we don't quite know yet. There are a lot of clinical trials going on, for example, for eczema, atopic dermatitis, allergic disorders. So far, they've not been all that exciting. But if it works, hey, I'm all for it. We just need to know um, if it does work, and then how does it work? We need to figure it out. So yes, in some cases, um, it may be appropriate. Yes? Uh, when are antibiotics called for? So in an optimal situation, you would want to have antibiotics when whatever the germ is, is getting out of hand and your own immune system cannot handle it. So for example, if you have invasion into tissue, like with pneumonia, where that germ is not held just in the bloodstream or not just superficially, but somehow it's been able to invade and actually set up shop in tissue, sometimes you actually need antibiotics to battle that off. The antibiotics go in the bloodstream, and then they can go directly to the site of the infection and can really help to kill those germs directly. So in the right situation, antibiotics are really, really helpful and obviously save lives. Um, the challenge is not giving antibiotics when they're not needed. So for example, cold viruses that we were talking about before, antibiotics don't help cold viruses. But when you have a patient who comes into the office and says, I'm so sick and I really need an antibiotic, and you have to kind of decide on the spot. Is this a viral infection? Is this a bacterial infection? Is there any evidence of pneumonia or more severe infection that would require antibiotics? And so sometimes it's pretty obvious, and other times it's a judgment call. So in the optimal situation, you want to reserve the antibiotics for a situation where the, where the infection has a threat of getting worse and potentially even killing you. Um, and pneumonia would be one example of that kind of situation. Yeah. Prophylactic benefits of antibiotics. It depends on the disease condition. Sometimes, for example, if we know you've been exposed to something that could be really nasty for you and kill you, it might be appropriate to use prophylactic antibiotics. So it's totally um, dependent on the specific condition. So, um, and I'm happy to answer any more specific questions that I can um, afterwards. But thank you all so much, and I'll look forward to seeing you next week.